uh, religion which before 628 was confined to a small group of emigrants in Medina conquered the world. So I it's think the, yeah. secret, the secret is in the Quran. <laughs> and finally, it's been staring us in the face for all these years. Um, but uh, no one has noticed. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. Special treat today on dealing with the time period where Heraclius, the emperor of the Romans, if you will, at the time in Constantinople and the origins of, if we could, Islam and the Persian war that's going on between Constantinople, the Romans, and the Persians. We're going to dive deep today. Today, I have Dr. James Howard Johnson. He doesn't really need an introduction, but we're going to give him one because you've never seen him here before. James Howard Johnson is Emeritus Fellow at the Corpus Christi College, Oxford and University Lecturer in Byzantine Studies. His research interests include the history of East Rome Byzantium between 500 to 1100 A.D., East Roman Byzantine Historiography, Institutional History, and the History of Inter International Relations and Diplomacy in Late Antiquity and the Middle Ages. I went for the brief one, my friend. Mm. Can I call you James during our episode? Uh, please do. Please do. Uh, by the way, I'm a quarter American, so I'm very, very willing to be called. <laughs> my grandfather, my father's father was American from wow. New Hampshire. Fought in the Civil War. Wow. On the north side. He was a drummer boy. That's made amazing. A fortune, made a fortune in uh, South America, retired to Europe. What? This is wild. Okay, so you literally are history. You're not just telling us history. Your family has some deep roots in historical situation here that you could trace back. So if you don't mind, uh, I want to introduce you and, and get into this topic because I think this is important. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and what you special specialize in? And while you do that, I'm going to show uh, some of your books and give little plugs for anybody who's interested in helping us out here. Oh, Lord, you want me to talk about my background? <laughs> well, uh, sort of typical uh, English, Scottish uh, background. I'm f educated privately went as an undergraduate to Christchurch, uh, one of the largest colleges at Oxford, uh, in 1960. Uh, finished my first degree, which was in classics, in 1964. And then, primarily, out of nervousness of going out into the world, having led a very secluded uh, existence until that point, I stayed on to do research, and uh, I chose to do it in uh, a field where my knowledge of uh, the, the Greek and Latin languages and of ancient history uh, would be of use. Uh, but the continuation of it into the early uh, into the early Middle Ages, where much less research had uh, been done, so uh, my life has been remarkably uneventful. I moved in 1971 from my undergraduate and graduate college of Christchurch to uh, Corpus Christi College, as you've already said. Um, and this was a move of zero millimeters from one adjacent college to the other adjacent college. So that, you could say, is a life in which no progress whatsoever uh, has been made. But in fact, when I did that move, I um, immediately began to feel rather claustrophobic in Corpus, which is rather a small college. And at that stage, I immediately uh, stood, uh, well, I was adopted as a candidate for an election in uh, the, for the, uh, the city council and later the county council. So for some 15 years, I was involved in local politics. And those are 15 years in which I published very little but in which I learned a great deal about the wider world, mm. my the division I represented, the political parties and the way they operated, and the local authorities. Um, 
And so uh, that's about it in a nutshell. Zero millimeters progress, but <laughs> certain amount of uh, experience outside. And of course, every long vacation, every summer, I would go traveling uh, in uh, countries which um, featured in my research. Well, I, I've enjoyed quite a few of your talks already as I've searched the internet to find. And of course, the books that I showed go down in the description. The Last Great War of Antiquity. You're going to really enjoy this one today, ladies and gentlemen. Also, consider helping us out on the Patreon. I am producing stuff nobody else is. Uh, nobody's done interviews with Paula Fredrickson. I mean, you can go find her on like a news station or doing a lecture at a college. But as far as a journalist like myself, going and sitting at the feet of someone like Paula Fredrickson and other academics, I have content you can't find out there. Help support us. We also have courses in the description with uh, M. David Litwell on ancient Greek mystery cults and Bart Ehrman dealing with the Gospels or finding Moses. We're going into all sorts of stuff. So please help us out in the description. All right, let's dive in. If that's OK with you, James, I want to ask you, uh, you published many books. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about the backstory of Islam, namely the Persian Roman War, which happened between 602 to 628. But before we do, can you tell us a little bit about the other book you published, Witness to a World Crisis? I noticed in that book, too, just tell us about the book, but also I noticed on the front cover, I've asked this question of Dr. Hoyland before, is I said, you know, especially listening to you talk about Heraclius, and we're going to get into some interesting things like <sighs> martyrdom and stuff that I think is going to be fun. But mm -hmm. these coins, one on the left, I think that is Heraclius. Correct? Yeah. The one on the right, though, is a mystery. I've been told this could be a caliph, or one of the caliph, um, but this could be Muhammad, I've even been told. Uh, it could be, but I think uh, it, it's virtually certain that it is, um, I mean, it's the formidable figure of a standing caliph, that they're known okay. as a standing caliph coins. Uh, uh, and you have to remember that, that this is an Islamic coin and uh, that dates uh, uh, so in th it, it, you, a religion in which in which th th in theory the human figure is banned um but it's an early it's an early coin a sort of threatening coin mm -hmm. uh uh issued i think in the six in the 690s okay uh, when things are hotting up so what's this book about briefly and we'll continue uh, right well it, it's just it, it, its origin was that i um uh, I'm writing about, uh, I was basically, I started writing about all the sources uh, um, uh, written at the time and then a generation or two later and then much later uh, from which one could begin to piece together the last great war of antiquity. But, um, and then I realized it had got so long that it better be published independently. And then it seemed to me to be rather silly uh, to, to have done all this work to produce the sources about the last great war of antiquity, when I could, they also deal with the origins of Islam. Uh, and so basically, it turned into uh, a, a systematic analysis of all the primary material of real value uh, that covers the seventh century, when the whole um, structure of the world uh, in the Middle East changed with the rise of Islam. So it's basically, uh, I, I'm doing actually something continuing. Robert Hoyland uh, started on this, uh, this sort of work in his first book, Seeing Islam as Others Saw It. Uh, this was basically a, a, a more, uh, not, I can't say more comprehensive, um, but a more focused study of the key sources to which I then uh, added uh, a few chapters of reconstruction of the history of the seventh century. Um, wow. So um, it, basically it's a sort of loving encounter on my part with all sorts of sources, beginning with one of the great poets of all time, uh, George of Pisidia, who uh, lived and wrote during the last great war of antiquity, so between 600 and 630 and on into the, six, into the 630s, a great, great poet, uh, sort of worthy uh, in, in terms of language at least to be placed alongside Shakespeare. 
Wow. That's, this is a wonderful topic. I didn't realize how amazing this, I, this topic would be until I started venturing into it, realizing mm-hmm. the implications of it. So um, if I may, mm-hmm. before we talk about these two superpowers, the, Byzant- the Byzantine Empire and the Sasanian Empire, there was a plague that hit the region before these two went to war called the Justinian plague. Can you tell us more about this plague? When did it start? How far did it reach? And when did it end? While you do that, I'll show us a show, a visual of the plague. Uh, Oh dear. (laughs) Yes. Um, The, the plague um, probably originated in the interior of East Africa. It reached the Mediterranean at Pelusium, so it's on the uh, easternmost uh, uh, um, uh, branch of the Nile uh, in um, autumn 541. It then, you know, the Mediterranean was, of course, crisscrossed uh, by uh, merchant shipping, shipping of all sorts. Um, so it then moved swiftly uh, north up uh, the coast of you know, the Middle East to um, Asia Minor. It reached Constantinople in spring uh, uh, 542. It spread west along the uh, North African coast. Uh, it reached uh, Italy, France. Uh, uh, we know from um, c- corpses that have been dug up and where the DNA has been uh, uh, analyzed that victims of plague were found as far away as Bavaria, so deep into the European continent, and uh, Cambridge uh, in England. Um, But texts, uh, references in texts, tell us that it got as far as Ireland. So basically, it's a universal, it is a real pandemic. Hmm. But oddly, it's a pandemic that when it got to land, didn't move that fast. So my own, uh, and in fact, we know from Gregory of Tours, who's a great historian of the Franks in the sixth century, he reports that a bishop of Clermont-Ferrand, which is right in the center of France, in the Massif Central, uh, was, had a vision in which he was told that he wouldn't die, uh, that he wouldn't live to see the plague come to Clermont-Ferrand. And um, he lived for eight years. And the plague had reached uh, Arles in the south of France, And it took eight years to get to Clermont-Ferrand. So it's nothing like the Black Death. And the reason, I think, is that um, whereas the Black Death was a plague uh, which became pneumonic, I mean, it it, it turned into pneumonia and became very, very infectious. I think there is no uh, uh, indication that this first plague, which was bubonic, bubonic, uh, but it, it spread through um, closer contact, much closer contact. So in fact, uh, though, you know, the death toll was high, particularly before people learnt basically to stay indoors or if they were living in the country, not to go to a town, um, it had nothing like the death toll of the Black Death. So it was a serious demographic shock. But at the time, the two empires to, uh, which you've been talking about, um, uh, were at war with each other. And there's a slight stuttering of the Roman effort, war effort, in 542. And there's a slight stuttering of the Persian for, uh, war effort a year later when the plague reached them in 543. But basically, they continue at it, hammer and tongs. Wow. So the, plague, uh, the plague didn't, you know, it wasn't something that changed the whole outlook of humanity at the time in the way that I believe the Black Death did. Interesting. Really interesting. And I think leading up to this, we'll talk about the two superpowers now, Byzant- the Byzantine Empire and the Sasanian Empire. If we could start with the Byzantine Empire, here's a, a map just to give everybody an idea of what it looks like. And if you don't mind, with, with its capital being Constantinople, and here we have the famous church which was built in the capital. You could see on the map here. I'm going to show you this church real quick in this video. This is the Haggai Sophia. It is indeed. And of course, this ends up eventually getting conquered by Islam. And uh, you can actually view the inside. You'll see a lot of iconography from Muslim (laughs) 
background. So to give people an idea, that is the Hagiai Sophia that was in Constantinople at this period. I just want to give people visuals. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the Byzantine Empire? When was it formed? How long did it last for? And who was the emperor during the time of Muhammad? Right. Uh, now, I'm afraid the first, I, I, I've got to be boring, um, is uh, just, yeah, you did refer to it earlier as the Roman Empire, uh, and you're now referring to it as, as, as the Byzantine Empire. Now, of course, it's both. Uh, uh, basically, the Byzantine Empire is what some scholars call the Roman Empire once it was Christianized in the, uh, the time of Constantine the Great, so the early 4th century. I'm afraid that I uh, tend not to use uh, that, uh, 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 that designation then because it's still the Roman Empire. Um, you know, at the beginning of the fourth century, it's extending uh, over, uh, you, you, there's a Western half, um, which, would, which wasn't shown on, on the map. Um, what you showed on the map is uh, the uh, Roman Empire, as I call it, the East Roman Empire, in, yes, the mid-6th century in the reign of Justinian, uh, when it has, uh, Justinian engaged in campaigns of conquest, uh, first in North Africa, then Sicily, then Italy, and then acquired uh, an enclave in southern Spain. Now, uh, I call it the, Ro- the Roman Empire, and I, I tend to, I in- introduce, I, so Byzantium is entirely, it, Byzantine is an entirely artificial term. It's introduced basically to mark off something later from so- something earlier. Uh, they themselves always refer to themselves as Romans. And in fact, the Arab world and the Turkish world continue to refer to them as Rum. Um, So, uh, but for convenience, for convenience, I I put the divide in the 640s. Basically, I put it in a specific year, which is completely absurd, the year 644. Uh, Why? Because that was the year in which the Arabs, having occupied Egypt, I mean, the Romans basically agreed to withdraw and did so Uh, I think it's by November, the agreement was they should be all be gone, all the authorities, all the troops, uh, by November uh, 643. Now, a year later, the Arab authorities had dredged the the canal linking the Nile uh, to the head of the Red Sea. And in autumn 644, (laughs) the first huge grain convoy from Egypt. Now, grain convoys had traditionally gone to Constantinople. The first grain convoy uh, arrived uh, at uh, Jeddah, the port for Mecca and Medina. So I see that as a crucial moment in which <laughs> the economic as well as the political center of gravity has moved east from the Mediterranean uh, towards, towards well, basically uh, inland in the Middle East. Uh, it'll end up in Iraq uh, a century on. Uh, so it's a center of gra- the economic center of gravity moves east, uh, and the, the um, and eventually ends up in Iran, Iran, where you have a whole series of uh, you know, urban flourishing in the ninth and tenth centuries. It becomes a sort of power economic powerhouse along with Iraq, of of the uh, the, the the western the western world. Now, so, in that- so, so basically, uh, yes. the Roman Empire is the Roman Empire which you showed of of Justinian, which had been somewhat truncated by uh, the early seventh century. Um, the Byzantines had been driven out of much of Italy. Uh, they they still control the area around Ravenna and the area around Rome and further south, but they'd lost control of the Po Valley and uh, Tuscany. And uh, they uh, were, uh, they still, they controlled North Africa. They were suffering a lot in the Balkans. They were at a war in the East with the Persians. And so just to, on the, I know there was multiple questions in that one question. Just uh, can we get into the emperor of the time uh, Muhammad is on the scene and uh, to give a coin, a couple coin images to tease people so they understand which emperor we're talking about here. Can you tell us about this emperor? Uh, yes, Heraclius. 
uh, Heraclius was the son of another Heraclius who'd been a successful, a successful general, not one of the greatest generals of the late uh, sixth century, but a successful general. And in the early seventh century, he'd been appointed exarch or uh, mili- governor with military uh, powers of North Africa. And uh, Heraclius, Heraclius was uh, his son. Uh, at the same time there, there um, no, I, it, and Heraclius had a, a cousin, Gregory. I think Gregory's father was also called Gregory. Um, and it, anyway, they are all involved uh, during the reign of the Emperor Phocas, who reigned from 602 to 610. They are involved in stirring up opposition to the regime, which was becoming more and more unpopular in Constantinople, where uh, the Senate, the Senate still existed, the Senate of the Roman Republic still existed. And the seventh century is one of the periods when it assumes actual power as well as sort of symbolic importance. And basically senators in Constantinople and these uh, dissidents in North Africa get in touch with each other. And then a uh, a rebellion gathers way, which begins to turn into something like a a very serious political revolution uh, in the empire. Uh, It gathers way between 608 and 610, when Heraclius arrived in a fleet at Constantinople, penetrated into the walls, caught Phocas, had Phocas executed, and took power. And he remained in power uh, until his death in 641. So uh, Heraclius's time in power, I mean, the first 22 years coincide with um, Muhammad's preaching. Mm. First at Mecca from 610 to 622, and then uh, at Medina until his death in 632. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, uh, James. So we've kind of covered him and we're going to get into him more, I'm sure. Now let's have a look at the other superpower, the Sasanian Empire. Here's a map of what it looks like for our audience to kind of be able to follow along and see, get a visual aid of what it may have been uh, on a map, what would have been covered by this power with its capital being, and I'm going to probably butcher this, but is Ctesiphon? Am I correct in pronouncing uh, yeah, yeah, Well, like Ctesiphon, I would say. Ctesiphon. Okay, Ctesiphon. Um, let me just show everybody. Here we have a famous palace built in its capital, Ctesiphon. And this is the remains that are still around today. You can tell it's beautiful architecture. Here's kind of a uh, what it would have looked like in mm-hmm. the time before it's destroyed and became a ruin. Um, I really enjoy these pictures to give people an idea, like what we're yeah. looking at. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about the history of the Sasanian Empire? When was it formed? How long did it last for? And who was the emperor during the time of Muhammad? Right, right. Um, the Sasanian Empire was formed in a great, uh, well, it's a successor to a Parthian empire, which was the successor to the Hellenistic rulers uh, who'd been established by Alexander the Great, who destroyed the original Persian empire. Now, uh, the Parthian empire was relatively loosely organized. And in the uh, early third century, um, the um, local Persians in Persia proper, so it's Fars, it's it's in the south, it's in the southwest, and there's Zagros Mountains, um, the original uh, heartland of of of, of Persia. Uh, uh, if I had a pointer, I would point to it, but I <laughs> can't. But it basically, it's it's well to the southwest, not the extreme southwest, beyond the Gulf of Hormuz. <laughs> forgive me would it be and like kind of under the words sasanian empire somewhere in the blue there basically you go uh you go down and to the left but uh, but, but uh, um and uh but inland from the straits of hormuz okay. um, the far south the far southeast is, is desiccated country that's where the hostage rescue went wrong in president carter's time 
um, uh, you, it, it's it's the, the hot lands close to Afghanistan. Uh, okay. Now, uh, the rebellion, the, the, a local rebellion started there. And then in a, so it's a classic case of the dynamic expansion of power. Each success bringing uh, the, the leading rebel, Ardashir, uh, more supporters and making it more likely that there'll be another set. So it's a virtuous cycle in which he, uh, um, stage by stage, uh, imposes his authority over the whole Iranian uplands. And then in the 320s, um, it's about 326, I think, uh, they take over the old Parthian capital uh, in uh, what's now Iraq, Mes- in Mesopotamia. Um, and th- that's the point at which, so the Sasanians basically were a new dynasty. And what year and, is this, just so our audience is following? Um, th- 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 now, y- y- you see, you're pressing me too hard. <laughs> uh, there, is a, there, is a, there is a certain amount of, of debate about the precise date. Right. And... Um, I'm. I think I'm going to say three twenty, three twenty six. Um, uh, but it, anyway, it's thereabouts. It's right. thereabouts. It's in, it's in the three. It's in the three twenties. And what you have is a new regime, um, which is more tight. It, well, it's more militarized. It's more centralized. Uh, it's basically geared um, to exploiting the enormous wealth of Mesopotamia, modern Iraq, um, to support basically the the political and military uh, plans of the Iranian aristocracy of the Iranian highlands. And so over the and over the next uh, uh, century or so, a series of wars were fought on all fronts, but notably with the Romans in the mid third century in which the Sasanians were remarkably uh, successful. Uh, this is in the reign of Ardashir's son, uh, Shapur I, uh, and his most striking campaigns, where he goes through much of the Eastern Roman Empire, um, were, I mean, in the, in, in the Middle East proper, uh, took place in the 350s. Now, if, if there's any Sasanian experts watching this, they're going to slit my throat because my my vague my my the, the vagueness on the dates. Of course, I haven't rebriefed myself uh, right. before before this session, but I, I'm giving you the main the main the main shape of it. And the the last of the early Roman Persian wars ended in the middle fourth century. Uh, this was a war that the Romans. Basically, the Romans started at the very end of the reign of Constantine the Great, and it carries on into the 360s, and it ends with the disastrous invasion uh, which, of Persia by the Emperor Julian, which ended in uh, his, well, in defeat, his death, and uh, a pretty desperate withdrawal of the Roman forces. And from that date, for for about the next 120 years, there's a there's a period of coexistence, and then war starts again in the sixth century. Now, but you want to know something about the Sasanian Empire? Well, I've said it's it's militarized, it's centralized. Um, it could probably uh, put out into the field uh, armies of the. Um, sorry about this ringing telephone. You're fine. Fine. I shall silence it. <laughs> no problem. Uh, armies of the same size as the Romans. I mean, they have to, and, you know, there are tremendous fortifications and armed military camps. It's it's a powerful, well organized uh, state if, uh, if, with an entirely independent culture. If I may, just to throw a few caveats to give your answers to as we're leading into the emperor during the time of Muhammad in the Sasanian Empire, two things I've heard the Sasanians or let's just say the modern Parthians or however you want to put it, this new Mm -hmm. regime, um, they've captured one of the Romans, uh, Roman emperors, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So it's a very important defeat. And in one of them, they had a hostage, uh, one yeah. of them. So that was a real good mil- military tactic there. Are they also kind of flying, uh, while they're an empire that may have various thoughts, even Christians may be part of this empire, mm-hmm. um, 
Uh, are they kind of flying under the flag of Ahura Mazda? Are they Zoroastrians at the top? A very, a very, very good question. It took me a long, long while, I think, really to appreciate that, uh, that there was a fundamental difference between the, uh, uh, the, the, the two empires. Uh, in the Roman Empire, uh, emperors uh, and churchmen wanted people to agree both on doctrine and on right ritual. And uh, it resulted in terrible, uh, you know, in conflicts of all sorts, which were carrying on through the 6th century and into the 7th century at the time of the last great war. And by the way, uh, it's one of the uh, criticisms of Muslims, of well, of Muhammad, that Christians were at each other's throats about, about doctrine. Now, we go to uh, Iran, to the Sasanian Empire, and yes, there was an official religion, which was Zoroastrian. So uh, an Ahura Mazda is the, the, the uh, supreme power on the side of good. Um, uh, but there probably were several strands within Zoroastrianism which, co which coexisted. Uh, but also uh, there were other religions very well established within the Sasanian Empire. A huge Jewish community uh, in Mesopotamia. Uh, the Babylonian Jewish community, responsible for um, uh, the Babylonian Talmud, so a huge collection of material on um, practice and belief, uh, and also large Christian communities um, of two denominations, um, uh, uh, Diophysites, that is Christians who were inclined to stress both the humanity and the divinity of Christ without insisting on their really close union, and Miaphysites, who were really insisting on the close union. Now, they are against each other, and they're also against the Chalcedonians of the Roman Empire. That's right. Uh, so you've got ba basically, um, you've got uh, the, the, the uh, Diophysites, or commonly known as Nestorians, so it's unfair, are strong in Mesopotamia, where the Jews are strong, and the Miaphysites particularly strong in Armenia. But then as well as them, there are lots of, there are Buddhists in the far northeast. Manichaeans it, as well, right? Yeah. And then, yes, indeed. The Manichaeans were persecuted. But these others are basically, it's a, it's, it's, I mean, it's rather an admirable tolerant regime. I like that. And I wish, you know, maybe we can learn from this uh, as in history. And we really could. Um, I love this. So just to get to the actual emperor during the time of Muhammad, who's this guy? <laughs> All right. Well, this guy is Khuzro, Khuzro II, uh, grandson of Khuzro I, who was the great uh, Shah and Shah at the time of Justinian. Uh, Khuzro II uh, succeeded his, uh, his uh, basically succeeded to the throne when his father Hormizd was overthrown and executed. Um, but the uh, the rebel who had brought about the overthrow of his father and his execution um, uh, was. Um, uh, uh, basically threatening uh, Ktesiphon. So the young Khuzro fled uh, to the Romans to seek asylum there and to get help. Um, the age of him is, it, it's, it's quite hard to gauge his age when that happens, but there's an Armenian source that refers to him as a manuk. That this means uh, a sort of, uh, 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 well, uh, it's, it basically means a young adult. I mean, uh, uh, it could mean a boy or a, an adolescent. And my guess is he's not much more than 12 or 13. And, so he's, and he's very much the creature of two powerful uncles. So what happens then is that in 591, uh, Roman help is produced. Uh, two armies uh, with, with, with a lot, lot of Persians involved invade. Uh, the usurper Bahram is overthrown and killed, and uh, Khuzro is installed on his throne. So he's in great, uh, very much indebted to the Roman emperor of the time, called Morris. Um, uh, he has to face all sorts of problems in his first 10 years, particularly from these very powerful uncles. 
But everything is reasonably calm when we come into the 7th century. And he gets the news that his benefactor, Morris, has been overthrown and uh, uh, killed by uh, the Emperor Phocas, to whom I referred before. And this then provides him with a pretext to go to war. And he lives on until the until 628 and he was executed on the 28th of february at 628 i, I know i've been i've been sloppy about days earlier on but i can get more precise now yeah no this is very we're getting to the hot spot so now i would like to move on to the war between these two and there were many highlights the persians and jews forming an alliance the persians capturing jerusalem taking the true cross Heraclius yeah. leading the fight back and rallying his troops to martyrdom. Heraclius not only re regaining all of the lost territory, but the true cross as well, which he brought back to Jerusalem on the 21st of March, 630 AD, and many more highlights. Let's begin with what led up to the war, if you don't mind. I know yeah. there's a lot between what you just said and what I just said. There's yeah. so much. We could spend multiple episodes diving into this material, mm -hmm. but I'm kind of doing a drive-by because our time is yeah. limited. Um, if you don't mind, what, let's begin with what led up to the war. <laughs> uh, well, the, the, you, with the causes. I mean, <coughs> <coughs> ostensible cause number one, I mean, the, a, a real cause number one, is the murder of Morris, uh, Guzro's beneficiary. But there is a, <coughs> in the background, as the price for Roman help, in 591, Maurice had extracted considerable territorial concessions, a large chunk of Armenia, a large chunk of Georgia, basically divided half and half, whereas before they'd been divided about four-fifths Persian, one-fifth Roman. <coughs> and, um, and of the key mountain chain, which runs... Um, east of the Euphrates, towards Lake Van, then goes into the Mount Zagros Mountains. This key mountain chain separates the Armenian theatre of war from the Mesopotamian theatre of war. And the Romans basically gained control of the central, the central and western passes. And this gave them a great advantage of being able to move troops quicker between the two uh, theatres of war. <laughs> I'm sorry about this coffee. Oh, you're I, fine. I've come, to, I've come back from um, a conference in, in Italy, diseased. But I'm, <laughs> I'm Hopefully it's uh, not bubonic, so. <laughs> no. Uh, I really hope it's not COVIDic either. Yeah, that too. Um, they, um, no, it isn't. Um, the, uh, so basically, I, I could say that the Sasanian Empire was gravely weakened on its Western front by these territorial concessions. So uh, gratitude to his, to his benefactor, uh, wanting to address the, the strategic balance. And then thirdly, basically war after war had been fought through the sixth century. Uh, and um, so basically I, I think that you know, there was a general souring of relations. Uh, and it's you know it was a great opportunity, and uh, in spring, uh, in in spring, six oh three, Khosrow gave the order to his uh, to his armies to attack, and they attacked. Or they had to attack on both fronts to keep the Romans busy on both fronts. Uh, but the much the weaker attack took place in the north, in Armenia, so north of these. Uh, of these mountains. And the main attack was in the south, in northern Mesopotamia, where the Persians went for the main forward uh, uh, Roman base, uh, Gordara. And after a siege of a year and a half, they captured it. And that's, um, and after it's fallen, they switch, they switch the weight of their attack back to the north and they make gains there. Then there's a year of pause while they uh, recruit more troops mobilize more men, I mean, sort of Putin-like, but mm. mobi effective mobilization. And then they resume the advance on both the northern 
and the southern fronts, the Armenian and the Mesopotamian. And it's a, it's a war, it's a grim war of attrition in which they push their way forwards, basically to the Euphrates, the Romans' inner line of defense, which they've reached by 610, at which point there is a disturbance within the Roman Empire, which is the Heraclean Revolution. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure that many troops were taken away from the front, but uh, certainly the resistance weakened and the Persians got uh, bridgeheads across the Euphrates. Um, so that basically prepares the way for a second phase of the war when the Roman Empire has been divided into two. I mean, there's Egypt, Palestine and Syria mm -hmm. to the south of the Persian uh, bridgehead, to, which has reached the Mediterranean. And there is Asia Minor uh, to the north and the west. And so thereafter, the Persians can basically move their forces either northwest or south and roll up um, uh, the map of the Middle East. So conquering successively Syria, Palestine. They actually occupied Palestine two years after the siege of Jerusalem. Uh, then, after a pause, uh, taking uh, Egypt between, a, well, the, the invasion is in 619. I think they've got firm control of it by 621. And then they prefer, pre prepare for the final battle, which is the battle for Asia Minor, uh, immediately east of Constantinople. There are so many questions and I'm in trouble because if I ask you one, we're going to go off into this. But um, so they, they conquer Palestine, they conquer Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned there's a large amount of Jews, especially like we talked about the Babylonian Talmud that are in this region. Yeah. Can you tell me about the alliance between the Persians and the Jews? Why did the Jews go up to the Persians in the first place? And was it a military alliance or something else? Um, well, the, uh, the, 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 the general notion that the Jews and the Persians were you know, working very close together, that basically was a Roman, I think that was a Roman propaganda uh, uh, view of things. Um, what we know happened was the Persians intervened in uh, 614 in Jerusalem because a pogrom had started as Easter approached and tensions between the two communities grew, uh, the Christians turned on the Jews and the Persians basically intervened to protect the Jewish community uh, in uh, Jerusalem. And uh, after the fall of the city, uh, in fact, they didn't occupy, they left, they left a sort of um, a control commission in the city, but they removed all those they regarded as the troublemakers, uh, including the patriarch, uh, and they, they removed uh, the, the, the true cross. Now, but the, the, the task, you, the Persians had a delicate task because they had large Christian and large Jewish communities in their homeland, I mean, mm -hmm. in Mesopotamia. So they couldn't tilt too much one way or the other. Uh, so I think that their, their policy uh, was to be as even-handed as, as possible. Uh, when they and, took over Jerusalem, did they hand over the city of Jerusalem to the Jews? No. No. What they did temporarily, uh, what they'd done temporarily after the sack was to open, was to allow Jews to move into Jerusalem without any controls. But when they reestablished, uh, when basically established their formal rule over Palestine, then they uh, reintroduced uh, basically controls basically to maintain the balance between the two communities in the Holy City, uh, basically because of the, the possibility of trouble back home if they didn't maintain the traditional balance. Mm. Um, so, um, but obviously, uh, the Jews being the minority in uh, uh, Palestine and Syria and Mesopotamia, did look to the Persians as uh, protectors. Gotcha. The Persians weren't going to really shift to become, uh, you know, conduct uh, the, the, uh, pogroms of the Christians. No. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about how uh, the fight back Heraclius did 
and and we have an entry in the Chronicle of Theophanies who died in 818. And I'm going to show the front cover for those who are interested in following the sources. Um, this is the Chronicle of Theophanies. Am I saying that properly? You Theophanes? Are. No, no, Theophanes. You're absolutely okay. right. That's how I always pronounced it. So in Theophanies, the uh, the chron- ah, the confessor, sorry. And in particular, this passage, <laughs> the emperor, and this is page 442. Yep. The emperor gathered his troops and gave them courage by assaging them with these words of exhortation. Be not disturbed, O brethren, by the multitude of the enemy. For when God wills it, one man will rout a thousand. So let us sacrifice ourselves to God for the salvation of our brothers. May we win the crown of martyrdom so that we may be praised in. And then it continues. Yep. I wanted to show this page. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can you tell us more about the fight back of Heraclius led and it's and is this rally his troops to martyrdom? Is this where Islam got its concept of jihad? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, I drew that passage to the attention of a great uh, historian of Islam, Patricia Croner, who was at Princeton and alas died young of, of, of cancer a few years back. And she got absolutely fascinated and began, you know, scouring the Quran for all of the for similar for similar passages. Now, uh, the background to it is this: that uh, uh, the Persians basically have wrapped up uh, the, the the Roman Middle East, uh, Palestine, Syria, Egypt, uh, by the end of 621, and in 622 they start probing into a, a, a Asia Minor, and Heraclius trains up, uh, it's a small elite force, he trains it up and leads them on a campaign for in the summer, in the summer months and they will win some minor success in Northeast Asia Minor. But then there's a crisis in the West and he has to go back to, to Constantinople. Uh, and basically the crisis is because a, a European, a great European uh, power, nomad power, has intervened uh, and attacked and attacked Thessaloniki. Now I'm mainly mentioning it because it meant that the count, the main Roman counteroffensive was delayed until uh, spring 624. Now, in spring 624, uh, Heraclius led this crack force, which I, I would put at not much more than fifteen thousand men, but they could, but they were uh, um, very well trained, uh, had tremendous stamina. They could outmarch. Uh, that was a crucial thing. They could outmarch uh, the Persian forces. Mm. Um, and, and once you've got you've got the advantage of speed, you've then got the adva- you've got more freedom of choice. And so, along with speed, but there was generalship, which was brilliant at using a deception and misinformation. So, in the course of of six twenty four, a Persian army which was assembling to invade Asia Minor found itself suddenly threatened, and it dissolved. And the, the uh, and the Shah and Shah Khosrow fled south. And basically, 624, Heraclius just could roam at will, de- devastating uh, the Persian northwest. That winter, uh, he wintered in what is now uh, ex-Soviet Azerbaijan, um, where he was obviously recruiting uh, uh, Christians from Transcaucasia, but also opening negotiations with the great power of Central Asia, that of, of the Turks. In 625, there, there's more uh, sort of operations in which this small Roman army is being chased by three Persian armies, but it's faster. It chooses the moments of combat and it, be, it beats them, you know, one by one by one. And that uh, and it's in the autumn, that autumn, that Heraclius was withdrawing north to allow his uh, uh, Transcaucasian allies to go home. It's at the point when they they stopped facing a Persian army, that Heraclius gave that speech, which you've just quoted, in which martyrdom is referred to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, now, that, in my view, uh, is, uh, uh, comes from an official history of uh, uh, Heraclius's campaigns, uh, which was commissioned from the poet George of Pisidia. And the, the poet George of Pisidia uh, made use of Heraclius's war dispatches sent back to Constantinople, uh, and 
uh, but inserted for particular highlights, inserted short poems of his own. And that we know is from a short poem of his own because we can detect the verse, the iambic verses. So this is the official account written immediately after the events wow. uh, by the official, the official historian. So it's trustworthy. And, so, oh, I apologize. I was going to say. Well, and, and, and basically uh, something of the same sort was said, not quite as clearly, uh, in spring 624 when the army crossed over into traditional Persian territory. And uh, that, I think, is where there's a phrase about death in battle providing entry into a uh, paradise. But the yeah. word martyr isn't actually used. I'm curious to get your thoughts. Like, do are, are we, um, we don't have the best data, but is there good reason to think that this, this, these sayings of Heraclius have spread down into Arabia and that Muhammad would have heard of Heraclius's bold claims, his, his faith position on these well, things? We can't. We can't rule that out. I mean, I, what I think is absolutely certain is that the, uh, uh, the Arabs of all sorts, nomad and settled in Arabia, would have been um, uh, you know, aware of the great war being fought in the north. And uh, some of the, you know, the apocalyptic fears of Muhammad, which show, uh, so, show themselves so forcibly in the earlier surahs of the Quran, uh, have their origin in human fears about what is happening to, to the world at that time. But whether it's a sp specific thing like this would have got down there at that stage, I, I think I doubt. But what I would, but where I would locate the origin of this idea is in fact uh, nearly 200 years earlier. You see, when the Armenians in uh, the uh, first in the 440s and then in uh, 480 to 482 rose up against the Sasanians, um, they, it, they were uh, much encouraged. I mean, they were obviously in a very weak position. I mean, they were, um, um, uh, well, I mean, they were, as it were, a very, very feeble Ukraine having to face, having to face, right. to face Russia. And so, and the clergy did what they could to encourage them. And we have speeches reported in the sources in which there are numerous references to martyrdom. They should fight to die for glory, uh, to them having, having halos. So I think it's current in the Christian world. It surfaced before in Armenia in the fifth century. And it's, um, it's sort of picked up, it's quite natural to pick it up. You've got a, a monotheist uh, uh, re religion in the Roman Empire. It's quite natural to try to harness religion to the cause of, to the cause of war. Right. Uh, so it's not too big a leap for Heraclius to make. And for for uh, Muhammad down in, in Mecca, well, um, the, uh, the, uh, there plainly are important Jewish and less important but still significant Christian influences discernible within the Quran. I mean, yeah. the inspired, the whole thing may be, but it's come through a human, human in intermediary. Uh, so, uh, but again, in Muhammad's case, as in as in uh, uh, as in Heraclius's, as in the Armenians in the fifth century, you've got a weak, uh, 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 a relatively weak um, uh, antagonist facing much more powerful enemy. Uh, so, really, it, it's it's a, it's, a it's a fairly desperate late move. Mm. And uh, I argue that that is the position of the Ummah, of the Muslim community, in um, by 624, when they are basically under attack from the Medinans. And that is when Muhammad, after the Battle of Badr, first declares that the those who died were martyrs. 
Thank you. Thank you for that answer. I'm this. This is the juicy stuff. I think everybody's been looking for. Now let's talk about what happened on the 21st of March, 630 AD, uh, when Heraclius brought back the true cross to Jerusalem. And let me show some images real quick here for people. These are beautiful images right here. Yeah. Um, all of these are different paintings, um, art of Heraclius barefoot there walking it back in. Um, here's another one really clear. That's uh, beautiful art. And there's another one bringing the true cross back. Um, mm -hmm. That I, I just really love that art a lot. And here, like, I just maybe you want to make a brief comment about this, but uh, I wanted to get into Sabios, if that's okay with you, the Armenian yeah. history, but <laughs> <laughs> you want me to just go ahead and continue? Oh, oh, right, yes. Oh, I thought you were going to pr produce a, a bit of uh, pseudo Sebios on the screen. Let's do it. Funny. Yeah, let's do it. I am. Um, but better than any words of mine. Yeah. yeah, so, okay, here we go then. We have Sebios, who wrote in his chronicle in 660 AD, telling us how everyone felt. When the blessed, pious, and late lamented King Heraclius had received the Lord's holy cross, he gathered his army with ardent and happy heart. He set out with a royal, re was this retinue? Retinue, yep. Honoring the holy, wonderful, and heavenly discovery and brought it to the holy city with all the vessels of the church, which he has saved from the hands of the enemy in the city of Byzantium. There was no little joy on that day as they entered Jerusalem. There was the sound of weeping and welling, their tears flowing from the awesome fervor of the emotion of their hearts and from the rending of the entrails of the king, the princess, all the troops and the inhabitants of the city. No one was able to sing the Lord's chants from the fearful and agonizing emotion of the king and the whole multitude. He set it back upon, uh, sorry, set it back up in its place and put all the vessels of the churches in their places and distributed the alms and the money for the incense to all the churches and inhabitants of the city. Yeah. So did the restoration of the true cross trigger any apocalyptic feelings that this may be the signs of the second coming of Christ and the end of the world? Um, I th well, there are, uh, yes, there, there are stirrings. The stirrings particularly are showing in, uh, the, in Syrian, in Syrian writings. Uh, but I think neither in the Roman Empire nor in the Sasanian, the Sasanian Empire at, at this, at this stage. I mean, it was a, it was a ceremony fraught with significance, um, I should just say that uh, the Roman, uh, you, you, when the war was going really wrong, so, uh, you know, in the run-up, uh, the, the, the late sort of 618, 619 to 621, uh, that's wh when the Romans could do very little. Uh, they could, of uh, course, pump out propaganda. And that's where uh, they focused, they began to focus on the true cross. And the true cross became a sort of a central, uh, 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 a central feature, and it was going to it was going to be the uh, real symbolic trophy of victory. Um, now, in um, in uh, six by this time in six thirty, there had already been two rounds of negotiation. There was going to be a third, but basically the peace was pretty much was pretty much uh, uh, fixed. Um, and Heraclius would be simply sorting, uh, reimposing Roman authority over the recovered provinces after after he'd been to Jerusalem. Uh, for the ceremony itself, it's a very, very significant day. You see, according to the Easter Chronicle, which was written at about this time, uh, which probably ended with an account of this ceremony, uh, the the third day of creation, when Wednesday, when uh, the sun and the moon, and the stars were created, that was when time began because you could start to calibrate it. Uh, and that was Wednesday, the 21st of March for the, the, for the Easter Chronicle. Now, the 21st of March was also the equinox. That is the start of the Persian New Year festival, Nowruz, uh, at, at which point the powers of, of good began, uh, would re-emerge and prevail over the powers of evil on, uh, on, uh, on earth. So it's a day absolutely fraught 
with with uh, significance mm. and that was a uh, and so that was a ceremony uh which then would um resonate through Christendom uh, for centuries to come and in particular many of the uh, manuscript illuminations which you showed are probably illuminations to the story of the um uh, it's the golden legend it's it's a it's a, a, a slightly embroidered uh, version of the story of the return of the cross about how Heraclius, in order to enter through the golden gate onto the temple mount had to himself uh, shed his imperial robes and get off his horse and come in as a man, a humble man on foot, and mm -hmm. then the gate miraculously opens. Now it's that story which is uh, which was which was being illustrated, but it it shows the astonishing grip that it had on the Christian imagination for the foreseeable future. I also have a sh uh, to show everybody the cave of the books, uh, the book. Sorry, the book of the cave of treasures, and this I think was written in uh, the end of the sixth or beginning of the seventh century. Yes. Just to read this, the king of the Greeks will go up and stand upon Golgotha, where our Lord was crucified, and he will set the royal crown upon the top of the holy cross upon which our Lord was crucified, and he will stretch out his two hands to heaven and will deliver over the kingdom to God the Father. And so did the people or did people believe that Heraclius was the last emperor before the second coming of Christ? Uh, no, no. Uh, basically, the... Uh, I mean, it's a very, very dramatic moment when the supreme ruler on earth comes to the, the most sacred place on earth. Uh, but the notion of the last emperor coming and laying down his crown, uh, uh, um, uh, that, uh, that basically is a scenario uh, which was um, uh, envisaged in a, a, an apocalyptic text uh, known as Pseudo-Methodius. And that's where it's fully it's fully uh, 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 articulated, and that's a text which has been firmly dated to the six um, eighties, early six nineties, as the um, a great civil war was turn was tearing uh, the caliphate, uh, the Islamic empire apart, and so Christian hopes were arising again in the Syrian world. So there's something of a stirring, as I've said, in these the, the, the 620s. Uh, but the real articulation of this uh, best known of all um, the, uh, the 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 the, the, the uh, apocalyptic texts uh, is is happening later, and it was it was giving hope, giving hope to all those who'd been uh, conquered by Islam. Wow. Few more here, if you don't mind, James. I uh, We have a hadith and an entry into the Doctrina Jacobi written in 634 AD, where oh, yeah. we have Muhammad also believing in the second coming of Christ. So just to read that, uh, Allah's messenger said, the hour will not be established until the son of Mary, Jesus, descends amongst you as a just ruler. He will break the cross, kill the pigs and abolish the jizya tax money will be in abundance so that nobody will accept it as charitable gifts and just to show the doc doctor uh, doctrina jacobi proclaiming yeah. the arrival or the saracens and he is proclaiming the arrival of the coming anointed one and christ so we have like non-muslim and then muslim sources yeah. kind of lining up that islam has a second coming of jesus doctrine built into its core yeah, well, uh, the, 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 the problem with hadiths is that these are much later scholarly comments on uh, the, the, the uh, you know the core the core texts. And, right. and basically, what what hadiths are trying to do? I mean, Muhammad, throughout his career, was adamant that he was simply a human being. Uh, he was simply a uh, a vehicle for trans uh, you know a transmitter of God's message to man. So what he did and what he said as a human being really was of no significance. But the Hadith are pre are basically presuppose that everything that Muhammad said and everything that he did is basically to, uh, should be viewed as a, an, uh, you know, an example to be followed by future Muslims. So this huge, so this huge literature was built up, uh, but basically going against the, the, the Prophet's 
uh, 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 the prophet's view. So um, uh, there's a complicated process of of trying to trace hadith back as early mm-hmm. as possible. I've no idea how far back you can trace you can trace that one. Right. As regards the doctrina Jacobi, Nupa Baptizati, so it's um, it's a fascinating uh, uh, text uh, because it's it, you know it's Christian. It's Christian. It's it's a Christian text directed towards Jews, but it's actually trying to persuade them to come over. It's not a sort of polemic. It's uh, arguments which are designed to to win them over, uh, and it's got several references to what is happening in the in the Middle East. Uh, but it's giving a Christian view of what the Muslims uh, were up to. So they're, mis- they're completely misinterpreting Muhammad. Because uh, as I've said, Muhammad, Muhammad basically viewed Christ as a much more, uh, you know, as, as closer to God than he, Muhammad, was. Muhammad was just one human being among other human beings. No question of him being the anointed one. Thank you so much for that. I mean, you kind of answered this here, but my question was, do you think Muhammad also believed that Heraclius restoring the true cross triggered off maybe some apocalyptic fervor or second coming of Christ and he wanted to be in Jerusalem as well? Uh, it seems that there's a mission where he's wanting to go and co- accomplish or capture Jerusalem looking at like Luke 13, 33, which says no prophet shall perish outside of Jerusalem. You kind of wonder mm-hmm. If he, being a prophet figure, thinks I gotta be in Jerusalem, I don't know. Well, <clears throat> you're cer- <clears throat> you're certainly right that Jerusalem, the holy city uh, for the Jews, so for the o- the Old Testament, the holy city for Christians, the the second the second great uh, set of uh, instructions for humanity from from God, that that uh, it was the holy city for. The recipients of the third revelation, uh, Islam for for Muhammad. Um, so the new religion would have always been uh, been looking towards Jerusalem, but uh, you see, back back in the six twenties, up until basically up until six thirty, when Muhammad uh, you know extended his authority over Mecca. Um, uh, until that point, there really was no. No prospect of uh, the Ummah becoming any sort of power. Uh, in fact, it was only in 628 uh, when there was an agreement was reached between the Muslims and uh, the Quraysh, the leaders, uh, the, no- the notables of Mecca, uh, which enabled the Muslims to start uh, sending out uh, missions to different parts of Arabia. It was only then that uh, Islam began to spread widely through the Arabian Peninsula. It was only from then that they could think of beginning to try to win over uh, the powerful Arab uh, federations in the north of Arabia. Mm. Um, so I think it was it was far beyond uh, the bounds of anything sort of conceivable. Uh, until maybe the very last year or two of Muhammad's life. I mean, certainly he did send, uh, one of his last acts was to send an army north um, in 632. But the the first actual fighting in Palestine, uh, we got a precise date for it. It's in uh, in February 634 when a victory was won in the hinterland of Gaza and the uh, Arabs were able to um, maraud at at will. Uh, So um, I'm in two minds. Um, I mean, I think, you know, Muhammad viewed himself as a prophet uh, to the Arabs in the first instance, but to uh, humanity at large in the second. And, And Jerusalem was the holy city. So I'm sure it would have been in the longer run, a target, as of course it was. Thank you. One more, and I'll let you go here. I want to move to Sabios again in this passage about Jews coming to Muhammad. So Jews went and gathered at the city of Edessa, and then um, just to skip taking desert roads, they went to Takistan, to the sons of Ishmael, summoned them to their aid. And this is in the history of attributed to Sabios. Yeah. Um, my question about this is, 
the Jews, after capturing Jerusalem with the Persians, lost it again due to the peace treaty they had made between Heraclius and the Persians. Do you think that the reason the Jews went to Muhammad was simply that they wanted to recapture Jerusalem again? Um, well, I think I wouldn't take... Uh, I, I think, I mean, the history attributed to Sebios is an, you know, it's a wonderful text. Uh, and because of the date of it, it uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's written within 30 years of the death of the prophet. Now, the passage that follows the one you were quoting yeah. is uh, remarkably uh, sound in terms, you know, Muhammad is a merchant, etc., and, and their, their beliefs. But this passage about the Jews, I think we're en- then again entering the minds of Christian at the time. So it's rather like uh, what's going on in, you know, in, in, in the views in North Africa about the prophet. Uh, this is a, 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 an Armenian view. So Armenia, well to the north of uh, of Palestine, an Armenian view, um, uh, knowing that there were close connections between Jews and uh, and Muslims. Uh, you know that there had been in uh, Medina. Um, uh, it, it's a it, it's it's very much it's a Christian view of it. Um, so I dare say there is some truth. To, there is some truth to it. I'm sure there were connections between north and between north and south, but the the whole tale of, as it were, the promised land and its promise to Arabs as well as Jews, because they're closely related. That I think is a is a Christian, uh, is a Christian sort of rationalization of what was happening. I love this. Thank you for your time, Dr. James Howard Johnson. I have questions about the Quran I'd love to get into with you. I'm thinking, especially with this Persian Roman war um, in upper Mesopotamia, there's this uh, there's like almost apocalyptic mythological narrative of a wall that we find within the Quran as well. That dual Quran and stuff like that needs to like there's some apocalyptic mythological <laughs> thing that's going on. I'd love to dive into this with you and get your take. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you want to tease us now or if you want to just follow up with another episode. I think let's, let's follow up with another episode um, on, on the wall that keeps out Gog and Magog. Yeah. I'll need to do a little bit of prep on that, okay. but on the Quran, I mean, I have a, I have a, I, 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 I think I've referred to it, that I, I went to a conference recently on the Quran, ex, which was being examined as a text. And everyone else was there, was looking at the text of the Quran and what had gone into it. But I was interested in the text of the Quran as a, a major actor in, uh, the seventh, in the events of the seventh century of its effects. And when I can read within it key passages which tell one uh, I think tell one how it was that this uh, religion, which before 628 was confined to a small group of emigrants in Medina, conquered the world. So I think the secret, yeah. the secret is in the Quran. <laughs> and finally, it's been staring us in the face for all these years, um, but uh, no one has noticed. That, I think that's a perfect way to end this episode. Everybody, go in the description, get the books, help support us on the Patreon. We love educating the world and giving you things you're just not going to find out there. I appreciate your time. Dr. James Howard Johnson, please get one of his books. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, are there any final words from you, James? No, no. Thank you. We are Myth Vision.